I, I come from the NEC labs research, the research labs in Germany. And this, I'll be presenting ClickOS, and this is work done by me and my folks at NEC, as well as some other people at the University of Bucharest. So uh, in one sentence, ClickOS is a VM to uh, do network processing. So what's the motivation behind it? A uh, long time ago, some folks uh, designed uh, the internet, and how does it look like as we, thought in, uh, we are thought in schools? End hosts uh, with a networking routine con containing switches and routers. Pretty simple. But in reality, uh, middle boxes um, are commonplace in today's networks. They are very useful uh, for a high number of reasons, and they extend operators' network for um, a lot of features. Security, such as firewalls, intrusion detection systems. Monitoring, such as um, uh, DPI boxes. Load balancers, dealing with uh, address exhaustion issues. Uh, performance, such as media gateways, transcoders, YDR accelerators, and some others of a more dubious nature, like the advertisement insertion box over there. I mean, the, I'm having some issues with the display port, so you cannot see exactly how this it look like, but these middle boxes are really useful, uh, but there are a lot of these advantages at the same time. First of all, they are really, really expensive. One of the, the, the boxes I showed you, like the media gateway, costs around 200K. Um, it's really difficult to add new features. Often, often you, you, you get locked in to vendors to upgrade your firmware, add new features, and, and so on and so forth. They are difficult to manage. It often requires specialized personnel to you know, manage the box. Um, and you, normally, you deploy these boxes to keep with the peak rate, so they cannot be scale like you add more like you want. Um, and it's difficult to share uh, these devices among other parties. And since it's a, hard, it's a harder market, it's, it's hard to new players come along. You know, it's hardware. So clearly, if we had some way to virtualize these middle boxes or um, shift these middle boxes to be software instead of expensive boxes, we would have, uh, we, we mostly would solve most of these uh, issues we have here. But it is still not clear if we can do it in software and really coping, coping with the performance that the hardware middle boxes can achieve. So we believe so, and that's what I'm talking about here today, and that's what we propose with ClickOS. ClickOS is a mini-OS-based um, Zen virtual machine that runs on top, uh, that runs Click modular router. So let me first talk to you a little bit about Click. Click um, is, a, is, a, is a framework uh, to design routers to, uh, and process packets, and has this concept of elements. Each of these elements um, uh, does an operation to the packets, or receive packets, for example. The configuration on the side basically decreases TTL and forwards back the packet to a different interface. These elements are contained in a configuration, and basically, you install it uh, either as a user space um, application or as a, uh, or, or as a kernel module. These elements are exposed, uh, their counters, uh, if we have a counter on an interface, for example, via variables on the um, uh, slash proc file, sy uh, file system. And for example, the counter, you have a count uh, element to re just a read only and reset to reset the counter, you just write one, for example. For ClickOS, we compile 262 of these elements, excluding the ones that deal with the file system. And if you want to further extend the click, you can just write new elements. It's quite easy. So an example of a click configuration looks something like that. Um, you have from Netron to receive packets into Netron to send packets out. You have an IP filter element that you know, allows packets from 10.01 uh, in destination 10.101. UDP packets, otherwise drops it all. Um, so you can see that it's, it's quite easy just to filter packets, for example. So what's ClickOS? Typically, we have uh, in Zen um, 
Our previsualized per operating system is slightly modified, we're on top of them. And the kernel and the applications are on top. In the, case, in the case of ClickOS, we use MinUS as our guest uh, operating system. And we just uh, run Click. And we call the whole thing ClickOS. So it kind of follows the trend of OSV in the previous pre presentation, or Erlang on Zen, Mirage, so that it's application-specific operating systems. So the work we did was having a build system to build kind of these mini OS apps um, that we used to build ClickOS. Uh, and it, what we, we get is a five megabytes uh, image in total, uh, in size. And we had to emulate the control plane. So we don't have a slash proc file system between VMs. So we had to emulate this over Zen via the Zen store. And we further reduced boot times uh, as well. We started with something like um, one second, and we get it down to 30 milliseconds boot time. And the most important uh, of the contributions are actually driving 10 gigabits for, all packets, uh, for almost all packet sizes. So in these VMs, what matters is not uh, bandwidth, but the ability to process really, really high packet rates. The talk will be focused on this uh, last bullet point, but let me just give you a one slide of what consists the tool chain and, and, and the tool stack. We compile, we'll compile a new lib, which is such slightly modest uh, libc. Um, it's normally used in the, for embedded systems, and it's already quite old, that version. And we compile as well uh, LWIP as our networking stack and some other utilities in order to, comp to compile click um, to MinOS. We, we also use this tool chain to build, uh, for example, iPerf and the fast package ge generator based on NetMap called PackageGen. We expect to actually port other applications on top of it. Our tool stack is based, um, we have our own tool stack. We don't use XCP, Excel, or SAPI uh, on Zen. We, we design our own Cosmos tool stack, uh, which is basically using the Zen libraries and we use Swig to generate the bindings for our tool stack. For now, we support Python, JavaScript, and OCaml. We, it just compiles for now. Um, the optimizations were, OK, it was, it was not exactly optimization. It was like a learning process. But most of the contributions of having slow boot, time, boot times were um, preferring OZEN store did, the new OZEN store implementation shipped in 4.2, if I'm not wrong. A different network attach. Uh, the hot plug scripts really slow things down, like 200 milliseconds. And further booting uncompressed image uh, as opposed to gzipped image. Actually, uncompressing the image takes longer than booting the VM itself. So that's it for the, the, the control plane. For this talk is about uh, how we actually improve this. And our main objective is to drive these packet rates. So 14.88 million packets per second for minimum size packets. For reference, a uh, TCP hack is a minimum size packet. Um, or um, for bigger size packets. Uh, 810,000 packets per second. So we did the performance analysis of this, the whole pipe. And normally we have, um, uh, we have our network driver attached to an uh, open V switch or Linux bridge and uh, a VIF for each VM, which is managed by NetBack. Then we have the shared memory the, uh, fold used with the Zen Ring API in event channels to exchange notifications, our NetFront, and our click environment. Additionally, we had two elements, so for our network interface, which is NetFront, and uh, so that's the key configuration scale for packets and so on. So when we plug all of this together, there were several bottlenecks. First, the Linux bridge, just a disclaimer, numbers uh, change all the time, so uh, these are actually a bit better in OpenVin switch, but uh, Long time ago, when we did this analysis and started working on improvements, it was something like this. Um, 
for maximum size packets, it was able to forward 3, 000, more than 3, 000, uh, 300,000 packets per second. When we place NetBack in uh, 350, and with the whole thing together, just roughly 225,000 packets per second, which corresponds to two to three gigs of uh, throughput. So there are a lot of issues on, on this pipe. And first of them all is the bridge that we use. Um, uh, afterwards, it relies on TCP, uh, the Linux host stack, which is not exactly, it drives 10 gigs, but not exactly with really high packet rates. Copying, uh, each time you want to send a packet, you copy that, um, you need to copy the page to the, the backend domain, and this copy, although it's done in batches, is really, really expensive. Um, relying on SK buffs, you know, we use a, it uses the Linux stack, so the allocation and manipulation of these socket buffers are really, are really expensive. And also, MinOS uh, backend and front, uh, front end driver is not exactly as mature as, as Linux, it's pretty functional, so it's also slow. Roughly two times less performance than Linux. And Rx was a mere, uh, like, 100 megabits of performance when we, we get it. So as starters, we started not, you know, killing the whole, uh, the backend and front end, and start doing uh, small optimizations on the backend driver. And we started uh, by replacing the switch called Valley. Um, I will talk a bit Valley and NetMap uh, right after. We did slight modifications uh, to Zen NetBack to support multi-page rings. This is work basically apported to NetBack, but it's work from uh, Wang Liu. And um, because we are relying on Valley, it doesn't use uh, SKBs. We removed that packet metadata manipulation. And overall, the results were actually nice, pretty nice. We get a three times better performance and 1.2 million packets per second for minimum size packets. So before telling the very last piece, let me give you just a uh, background on NetMap. NetMap, uh, available in FreeBSD and Linux as an out of the tree build, uh, is, a real, is a fast packet IO framework that drives line rate for a nine megahertz um, uh, CPU down clock to nine megahertz. It roughly corresponds to 67 nanoseconds per packet to fill up the 10 gigabit with minimum size packets. It requires uh, changes on the device or on the device driver, but these are minimal uh, changes just to support the netmap mode. Um, but the, all the NIC registers and uh, physical memory addresses and the, the, the packet descriptors are, expo are not exposed to user space in any way. These must be validated by the kernel when you pull for packets and thus not accessed by user space. It's similar to what uh, Net Channel on the previous presentation, where you map the uh, software ring into user space and you uh, use all the data structures, copy packets, and basically pull and flush this out, bypassing the Linux host stack. Um, Valet, on the other side, was born like a small extension to NetMap and its uh, software switch. Um, that drives f between virtual ports, uh, 18, around 18 million packets per second. Lately, in the latest release, like 22 million packets per second. Uh, the graph on top shows a, a comparison of all the three switches, the FreeBSD Bridge, OpenV Switch, and Valley. But just a small um, um, uh, detail. The Valley, Valley case is between virtual ports, whereas the, um, the OpenV Switch and Bridge are between two NICs. So we did this, uh, a, a number of um, extensions to Valley uh, to let us attach NICs to the switch, to modularize the switch, which means you, you, could, you could implement your own switching function. Um, and having your own kind of modules that extend the, 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 the switch. And basically the way you use the switch is like a normal NetMap API. Uh, uh, not normal application using NetMap API. So plugging in all of this together, we, we write, um, we 
got rid of the, the netpack and netfront and we implemented one of our own. Whereas it's a really small netpack that uh, tries to mimic what uh, the kernel does to the application. We, do not, we, we remove the extra copy, which means the buffers uh, are granted to the, the, to the VM. Um, the ring protocol is not the same as in Zen, like you have a request and expect an IO response. You, you copy packets to the ring, notify the backends, and you forget. Um, event channels are used to proxy uh, the, the poll. So when you send a packet, you need to poll in the user space, you need to poll the, the ring to send the packets out. And in this case, we emulate this with event channels. But the biggest problem with this is that we break uh, Linux and other front ends. But to, to show that it's, these optimizations are viable, we also implemented Linux um, as, uh, as a, a compliant front end. The, we eliminate the copy, so I thought I, it would be good to mention how much memory do we share. Uh, Netmap buffers are allocated in contiguous pages, and buffers are around 2K, so which means for the, the normal ring size of uh, Netmap, which is 1024, you share a total of two megabytes per ring as of Netmap API version three. Uh, we provide different ring sizes uh, uh, as a form of, depending on the throughput your, our click OS VM or Linux requires, we, you require a smaller batch. So basically, e, the way Netmap works, you basically issue uh, IOCTL uh, to open the Netmap device. You do, uh, you, no, you open the Netmap device and you do an IOCTL to register the interface to Netmap, which detaches the Linux uh, from the Linux host stack. Then our backend will grant the front end um, the ring and the buffers, including the grant references of the ring of the buffers inside the ring slots. The front end on the other side grabs the, the grants regarding the ring and checks the, the reads the slots in order to map the rest of the buffers. Um, so to run our click SVM, the minimum memory requirement. Uh, is for 64 ring slots, it's uh, six megabytes in total. And we drive uh, 10 gigs for, um, uh, with this ring size as well. So let me just uh, show you uh, some performance evaluation of our system. I told you that our VMs boot in 30 milliseconds. Uh, and this is when we boot 400, how does the boot times evolve? So you ask yourselves why we want 300 milliseconds uh, boot time. The main um, motivation is that you are able to react as the traffic which is peak, uh, reach a peak. And you can expand the number of virtual machines in other machines in order to cope with higher rates. When I say higher rates, like 10, 20, 30, 40 gigs, for example. So the time to create a VM evolves from 22 milliseconds up to 220 milliseconds. The time to instantiate a click configuration uh, takes around between five to 20 milliseconds. Regarding the packet performance, we got a huge, huge improvement and we basically achieve uh, around nine million packets per second uh, for receive side. And uh, for TX, uh, we achieve 1438 million packets per second, which is 95% of line weight for minimum size packets. This, although has changed a little bit on the latest Netmap API version, which we are down to 11, 12. Uh, and you can see that as we decrease the ring size, we decrease the throughput as expected. The cost of event channel starts to be a bit more visible. Um, but as you can see, all the other packet sizes, uh, we fill up the pipe. This was tested on a low end server of four cores at 3.2 megahertz, uh, gigahertz, with dual port 10 gigabit, uh, 10 gigabit NICs. Each core is assigned one, one, CPU, one CPU core for, a, for the VM, the rest for DOM zero. 
So after, after getting um, uh, 10 gigs, we ask ourselves how we would scale for more nicks. So we actually run some experiments to see if we, could, we were able to drive 40, um, 40 more, 40 and up to 80 gigs of uh, throughput. And we actually did. So the, the bars are TX only, just VMs doing a packet generation. And the lines represent forwarding. So VMs actually processing packets and forwarding, forwarding back to the outside world. And we achieved 40, uh, roughly 30 gigs, um, 30 gigs for, for, for three ports. And this is only the rate you receive. So remind that it's, uh, it fits full duplex. It's the double, double of the, the performance, roughly. So if we manage TX uh, with RX, it's actually 60 gigs around that. And we don't, we don't, the, the, we don't exactly scale that well for minimum size packets over uh, multiple NICs. Again, this was uh, one of the same setup as the previous experiment. Uh, we assigned three cores for DOM0 and um, three cores for other VMs. Uh, each of uh, the cores has one NIC, the, all the NIC interrupts assigned to it. Otherwise, otherwise the, the, the NIC starts to starve and the, they, they are not able to process all the packets. So there was a bit fine-grained um, tuning on the interrupts. So the Linux guest performance also gained some huge uh, uh, improvements, but a disclaimer, this is, not, uh, this is not exactly a fair comparison. So uh, the bars, the highest of the bars, are, the, the highest bars are using NetMap API, which, which Zen and KVM don't support it. Um, and you still get all the bottlenecks of the host uh, TCP IP host stack. Um, so this is actually my, my favorite graph is when we actually run middle boxes uh, on ClickOS. So the first one is just um, uh, packet forwarding. Uh, so it doesn't touch the packet. The second, the second group of bars is an Ethernet mirror. Basically, it changes source and destination MAC address, forwards back the packet. The third one is a standards compliant IP router. The fourth is a firewall loaded with 10 rules. Uh, the car grade NAT, which has, I think, 10 flows with randomized ports. Uh, uh, software BRAS, which for those who don't know, it's uh, the first hop of the um, DSL subscri subscriber. And it does the PPP termination, PPPOE termination, IPLCP handling, and session management as well. A load balancer, a flow monitor that gathers statistics about the flow, and intrusion detection system, just um, checking the, the contents of the packet with just five rules. After that, since this is a middle box, it's not a hand system, uh, it's actually important to have really low delay. And uh, our ClickOS machines add just 40 uh, microseconds of delay to the, the, the whole traffic. And we compare it with other systems and we almost cope with DOM zero's delay. And we did the best of our efforts to put the KVM uh, setup the lowest possible. And uh, we got also huge uh, improvement compared to the Linux DOM, DOM new de um, delay. So this is ClickOS, um, a really tiny virtual machine to drive to do packet processing. We drive 10 gigs. I will show you a demo uh, just right after uh, the, the presentation. I'm, I will be at the Zen booth uh, tomorrow between 10 and 11. So feel free to, to go there and I, I ask any questions. I will show you uh, more demos. Um, and uh, in the future work, we are invest, uh, exploring the performance uh, on NUMA systems, which is not exactly that good. Um, doing high consolidation of uh, these VMs, something like running 1,000, 2,000, 2,000 VMs. Um, uh, we did some experiments in already at two 2K VMs on a single machine. 
and doing service chaining of these virtual machines, like chaining these fun network functions uh, with each other um, to do more packet operations. Last and not least, uh, in the Zen Summit, we, we, we told that we would be open source, but we weren't clear how it would take. There is a um, presentation on NSDI 2014 about ClickOS, and we'll be open sourcing on that time, which is April 4th. And, we, and that comprises mini, uh, patches to MinOS, uh, uh, RF, uh, request for comments on the backend and frontend drivers, and more things to come. So that's it. Hope you guys like it. Any questions? We second picture in this presentation, I think. Uh, and you had uh, stuff like uh, paint yeah. uh, and TTL. What, what is it? The configuration is uh, pretty simple. It just decreases the TTL on the ICMP request. Just that. It's just to visualize how the configuration works. Just decreases TTL and forwards back the packet out. Ah, paint? Paint is just a click internal thing to mark the packet if you see it said again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not actually something on the packet. Yeah. So it's like a switch jargon? Sorry, sorry? It's like a, a jargon for this. Uh, yeah. Can we keep the questions? Should we get them from here? Oh. OK. Yeah. He was asking that um, uh, what the configuration does, the TTL, and what paint, paint means on click. Excuse me? On, on the diagram, the yeah, yeah. This is for just one VM. Actually, right now, it's on FreeBSD 10. It's already in FreeBSD 10. Yeah, exactly. So NetMap is normally uh, referred to Nix. Uh, Vale is a switch. Uh, so they kind of work together and they use the same API. So it, the API is really quite simple. Uh, if you go to, uh, so this is from Luigi Rizzo. Um, and we, had, we, we made some contributions, which are already on FreeBSD 10. So you can attach a NIC, you can attach the host stack, you can extend the switch with your own switching functions. And all of that is already in FreeBSD 10. Any more questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, rates, the rates I'm showing here, uh, so for example, the middle boxes, is that it's actually, that's, for example, that setup. So the middle boxes on one design machine, one of them, and two end hosts with normal TCP, uh, Linux stacks and all that. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure if I still have uh, Nine minutes, and I would like to show you uh, a demo. So this demo, it's so I the resolution is not exactly quite good, but um, this is just to show how the just to show the boot times, and we. 
So basically, you have the create VM over there, and Cosmos is very similar to Excel, for example. And basically, you create the VM over here, and we start the click configuration. Um, and let's see how it, how it does. You basically, we boot 100 VMs. Now, on the other machine, they are connected back to back. We just ping the VMs to see if they are actually working. So, in Senar ping, so it goes to every single VM, and every single VM runs the same configuration, answers to the same ping. So. That's it. There are more demos, like on-demand, 10 gigs, uh, seeing an HTTP transfer with a VM booting on-demand. And can see all of that. Just go to the booth. I'll be there at lunchtime in 10 to 11. Thank you. João Martins. Ah, ok. How, how do you... Uh, João. 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 It's Portuguese, it's a bit difficult. Uh, I see. So, unrelated uh, question. Uh, I had before the uh, NIST and they had like glass and they had this one. Do you know what glass is? No, no, no. Islam is Islam. Islam is Islam. No, you put it on when you speak in, I'll go up. Um, uh, you say something, right? Yeah, what do you want to and, say? Then, and then if it's whatever, in whatever language you prefer, it doesn't matter. And whatever, and, and then if it's, if I, if I say, if I do that, it's fine. And then if not, you may, you know, you may have to adjust the microphone okay. or something. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what resolution are you on your laptop? Um, I think I configured it. Yeah, I've configured it already. Wait a second. That's... Yeah, thank you. Great job. Okay, no problem. What I what do I need to do? Yeah, just talk it. I I go up. Okay. Start talking. Okay. No. To show the slides. Perfect.
שומעים אותי אם אני מדבר פה? Just tell me when to start. the timing for you as well so if you occasionally look up I cannot give you 10 minutes to yeah. five okay yeah I have a clock yeah. oh you have a clock perfect Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, I want to start. Hi, my name is Gilad. I work for Red Hat. I'm a co-maintainer in the Ovid project, and I'm working for the SLA and scheduling team. Today I'm going to talk about VM <coughs> scheduling within Obert, how it got evolved, and etc. Basically, we'll talk about the problem of scheduling a little bit, then we'll go ahead and talk about Nova filter schedule concepts, and then we'll deep dive into Obert scheduling, giving a lot of samples. I think the best way to understand stuff uh, with, through uh, samples. Okay, can you raise your hand if you heard about Overt? Yeah, I guess a lot of you are. It's a home crowd. So Overt, for those of you who are know, do, those of you who don't know what is Overt, Overt is a, a management platform for VMs based on KVM hypervisors can handle thousands of VMs, has live snapshot, live storage migration, live VM migration, live, everything is live, basically. And, sorry, we support also advanced network configuration for those hosts, and a lot of uh, storage connections, SUN, NFS, cluster, etc. Basically, let's see what we've got a long time ago. Uh, we got the questions from the users list. I urge you to use that list if you have any questions about over it. It's quite, you know, it's quite active. How can I define a maximum number of running VMs per host? Uh, it's pretty trivial, but we didn't support it that yet then. So we get back to it later. I just wanted to say that you should use the users list. OK, what we had in over it a long time ago, basically we had two distribution algorithms for uh, running and migrating VMs. When we selected a VM, when we ran a VM, then we selected a host based on CPU load policies either even distribution uh, CPU load or power saving. And then it's pretty, you know, uh, limited. We have only two distribution algorithms and we can't construct a user-defined one. Basically, that is it. Then, uh, we take, hi. We take a look. We looked at the Nova scheduler, which, is, which, which brought us filters and weights. Very simple and easy way to filter, uh, to schedule VM on hosts. Basically, the filter is a very cut and clear logic that gets a set, gets a set of hosts on the left-hand side, then we run a filter on, on them, then we apply weight, weights on top of them. Another cool slide from Nova Scheduler. We collect, a, we collect a set of weights, then we sum them up, and then we order the host that we got. Let's see a, sim, a simple sample for Nova Scheduler. Uh, this is a RAM filter written in Python. Basically, it's a very simple method that gets a single host data and then and a set of properties and then run a really simple code that either uh, decides if this, this, this host is in the scheduling process or extract excluding, excluding it from the scheduling process uh, according to the requested RAM for that VM. Okay. When we looked at that and took it to the data center virtu virtualization, which is over it, we saw that we have a little bit of problem with that concept because in, in uh, Nova, <coughs> each filter and weight is applied on a single host, and we have a larger concept of uh, clustering in over it, which called migration domain. So in, that, in, in the migration domain, each, ho each VM on a host can be migrated to a separate uh, host on that migration domain, that cluster. 
And we have another concept of load balancing uh, for that cluster. And also a policy container, which a user can decide and create its own policy and apply that on that cluster. So let's take a look what we had in Overt. Basically, we can create internal and external filter and weights. The internal part is used for better performance. We are in, within the server, so we get a quick access to the DB. And originally, all the, all the filter and weights from the previous uh, over the, back then when, when we didn't have uh, filters and weights were migrated into that internal scheduler. And the external that you will, basically all the users can support and extend. Uh, we apply all the filters, uh, we apply the filter and, and weights on all the hosts in the cluster for better performance and we want to have a better grasp of how the, uh, the cluster behaves. We have uh, containers we call cluster policies. For each, for each cluster, we can define the set of filters, set of weights, and a single load balancing per each cluster. And then we support custom properties that you can, it's kind of passed through to, to the filter and weight. This is a diagram of the new model. On the, le on the left hand side, we can see a set of hosts within the cluster. Then we apply each filter, chaining each filter one on top of the other. And then we construct a weight table, which gets us the result of uh, the selected host that we want to schedule the VM on. Uh, we had the same concept in, uh, as Nova and filters. The existing logic that we had previously which were basically validation, was uh, migrated into uh, internal filters, and we can extend it using extern uh, in Python using the external scheduler that I will get into later. I want to sh show you a, a really easy sample of how we can use filters. Basically, this is a f filter in Python. The name of the class will be the name that we that the end, that the server gets. The properties validation are basically a set of property that you can add within the server and then the filter will get it. This is the name of the filter and this is actually the signature that you need to override in order to extend our uh, to extend a filter, to add a filter to the system. This is how you get this is how you get the custom properties from the, in, within the filter. Basically, I didn't tell you what the filter is all about, but here you can see we get the time and if the time is within the interval that we get from the from the user, then we Print the, the, we, we print the host, we return all the hosts that we got. If not, we just uh, remove, exclude all the hosts from the filter. That's kind of a bank example. Okay. Let's talk about the weights. Uh, it weights uh, all, the fil all the hosts that pass through the filters. We have the predefined weights that the First two are, uh, are CPU load filters, and then in 3.4, we added a lot more weight models. I said filter. Weight models, which is kind of easy now to add because we had the new architecture. Each filter can uh, uh, have factors. It, we can prioritize the, fil the sorry filters. Each weight can have factors, we can prioritize the, factor, the weights using factors. We can also ex add external weights. Let's see another sample. In this sample, we use a connection to, our, uh, to the server using 
uh, uh, Python SDK that we have, this SDK is backward compatible and stable. We connect to the SDK and then the logic of, of the weight is Basically, we iterate over all the, uh, all the host and we append to a list a tuple of the host ID and the weight of, the, of that host. Here it's a little bit cut, but the, host, the weight of the host is the number of active VM, VMs on that host. So if we have a host with Basically, it will be ordered by a uh, num uh, number of uh, running VMs within that host. Let's continue. Talk about uh, the load balancing. Th that th that's the third model we have uh, in the cluster policy. Each cluster policy can have uh, only one uh, load balancing logic. Basically, you can do whatever you want within the load balancing, connect to the SDK, and you can shut down everything, basically. But what we support internally is that the load balancing logic will return a VM and a <coughs> set of hosts. I will show it in a sample later on. Uh, and we will migrate that VM, a single VM, uh, within the server. It's basically more safe to, to migrate a single VM within you know, a, a period of time, not to cause a migration rust, and I don't know, uh, use all our resources for that. It's pretty not safe to do that. You also have a pretty fine load balancing uh, within, over it. The two legacy ones on CPU and now added in 3.4, even distribution one that we, even VM distribution that we didn't have. The same uh, balancing sample that I want to show, as I showed earlier, is we get the same number that we want to shut down all the VMs, but in this example, we will actually do that and not exclude hosts that uh, prevent users from running host uh, VMs like in the filter example. Here we will show how in that hour, in the wake up hour, we will basically uh, get all the hosts and if it's wake up hour, we will activate all the hosts. If we need to sleep and the uh, uh, then we will connect using our SDK and get all the VMs from that host. We will stop all the VMs and we'll deactivate the host. Same bank uh, example. This is how we use it internally to migrate VMs. You get, uh, according to some uh, logic, you get the overloaded host it's a cold snippet, then you select, here it's random, the first VM on that host. Then we actually print it because we're using, we're using SCDIO to, to get the data uh, from, the, from the module and we return it and we return a right listed host, which is kind of a filter, the first filtering we do before we activate uh, the filter and weights and the normal process that we do. Basically, as I said, we have a cluster policy, which is a container for all the filters and weights and a single loading ba uh, balancing logic. And we have two optimizations for a cluster policy. Uh, speed and overbooking. Basically, we run the, each time we schedule a VM, we run it one by one because we want to prevent uh, overbooking. Uh, the same, we want to, we want to guarantee the same uh, resources for, for each VM. If we will uh, try to schedule two VMs together, we can fail because they, they, bo they both see the same uh, resources. So basically the speed optimization is 
to exclude the way of the of the hosts. So later on, the load balancing will do the weighing for us and balance out the the, the cluster for us. And the overbooking is to emit the I don't know the just be able to parallelize this, the scheduling uh, process. Let's see if we can have show those pictures within over it. Okay. No. Okay, this is over it. The VM is, you know, because of Wi-Fi and and VPN, the VM is unknown. It's running somewhere. Okay. Here I configure that's it. Here I can configure a new cluster policy. Can give it a name like the shutdown one. I can uh, add the external filter that I've added to the system, the shutdown host filter, to the enabled filters. Uh, as a weight, I, I will give uh, optimal for power saving. That's try to aggregate the, all the VMs for within a single host as much as possible. Then I will uh, select that I, uh, the balancer that I uh, created earlier. I can give it wake up power like 8 a.m and shut down our eight, press OK, <coughs> should be created. OK, I don't know what happened. Just a second. What? Okay, let's go back to the. It takes some time, actually. No, no, it shouldn't take some time. What? Yeah, I'm not connected to the VPN. It talks about some time. No, no, the v something happened to the VPN. Doesn't like me. Yeah, I have screens. I have screenshots, but you know, maybe it will work. Second, okay, let's take a look at the screen. It works, believe me. <laughs> okay, we were. We were here. Wait a second, I'm connected. No, still no. Never, never mind. I will show you that one. Then you go to cluster. No, still not working. Okay, forget about it. Okay, I create the cluster policy that I've showed you. Then I create it to a cluster that I already defined. So all the hosts within that cluster will act according to that cluster policy. OK, let's talk about how it's implemented the, in, you know, the back. It's disabled by default. Uh, whoever wants to extend to add filters should be able to know how to install the external scheduler. The external scheduler is a separate process uh, written in Python. We externalize it because we want to guarantee the engine safetyness. You know, if a user writes a code, it can be dangerous to, to the system. 
We want to allow other long languages as well. Uh, if you know, the end over it is written in Java. So, and this model is, is written in Python. And going forward, we want to, to uh, support uh, SAS, which is kind of a scheduling as a service. Yeah. It's a separate RPM. You need to uh, manually install it. Uh, how it works, basically, it's initialized. It runs, it reads from a local directory all the filters, uh, weights, and, and balancing logic that you, you wrote. Then it's published in an internal API. The engine, the server, reads it, and then it waits for a calls from the engine for filtering, weighing, and balancing. This is how it looks like when it's loaded, uh, the filter and load balancing here. OK, uh, back to the users list. Now we can easily write a filter that, uh, that maximizes the number of running uh, VMs per <coughs> host. pretty early. OK, to sum it up, uh, we support uh, easy Python uh, plugins for you to use uh, for VM scheduling. Uh, you, can, you can manage a separate policy for each cluster, for each group of hosts. And every version that comes out for over it gets new models for scheduling. Questions? Yes. So the question is that I have the possibility to read from what the hypervisor provides, uh, memory utilization, CPU utilization. Yeah. Um, since you have a Python extensive API, if I got it right, yeah. you may have the possibility to know if the storage behind or the storage framework behind is constrained. So you have the possibility to say, all right, do a storage migration, these virtual machines to the other. Uh, storage which is SSD based or whatever. Yeah. So you just need, for example, to have a good talk with all the storage big guys and find more things about their, their IOPS and what we are doing on their storage. Yeah. You have to get that permission, right? Basically. Yeah, yeah. Because we have the memory, we have the CPU, maybe we have some store, some network information about throughputs and stuff. Yeah. So what's left behind is the IOPS and the quality of the storage. You can think of whatever, you know. The you all heard a question? I think so. Yeah. I think you, in within, you know, when you extend. OK. You can do whatever you want when you extend, you know, a filter or when you basically can connect to every provider or use any SDK that you like. So. What we provide within the the engine is all that you ask, you know, memory and and CPU load, and if you want to connect to other external provider, that it's your own choice. Did I answer? Hi. Um, so we had a few guys in the overt workshop in Bangalore. And they were asking us to connect the scheduler to a BMC system that is monitoring extra uh, parameters. For example, they can monitor um, the CPU temperature and the fan speed. And they can actually predict that if the fan, fan speed is constant or zero and the CPU temperature is high, that host is going to crash and burn in a few minutes. So what they asked from us is to give them a list of hosts, and they can actually blacklist some of them because they are aware of more information than what over should have. And there are so many other examples which are very similar. Uh, for example, Cisco has very similar concepts. They actually want to blacklist some of the hosts because the networking is going to go down there. There are a lot of very similar scenarios in very big enterprises. This is actually highly wanted. Absolutely, sounds promising. Yeah. 
So now you have the power, you can actually do it yourself. Well, my first idiot single question yeah. was, all right, I know about my CPU, my memory. Uh, maybe I know about my networking because we do the networking. So the next good thing is, if I had the storage IO information or information that had to do with the quality of my storage, perhaps I could utilize uh, multi-tiering in a storage or uh, storage remotion of a virtual machine from one place to the other. That could be nice with this engine. So the endless use cases of this Questions? I think we're down alley. Go drink a beer. Thank you. Thank you.